receives justice and fairness knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Well, we're not in that area today. There's probably not masters and slaves, at least in this church, or you may hit your spouse and say, listen in. But verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. God, we ask you that you would open our hearts and minds to receive from you. Because you care for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know what's so interesting? If we really strive to do the work of God, what do I mean by that? It doesn't mean leave what you're doing and become a pastor. If you strive to bring Christ into everything that you do, to work for Him, to say, God, I'm going to let my life, my relationship, my uh, work uh, efforts, my kids' lives, everything is going to detail and surround around relationship with Christ. There is incredible power in prayer. When we pray, things happen. When we pray, things happen. Now, I, I'm going to set the premise here, then I want to give you a little bit of research. When I was in Malawi, I was there doing what God wanted me to do. I know it for certain. Every step that I took, I said, God, I'm going to do this with all my heart, with all of my ability, until I can't do it anymore. And uh, One of the days we were there, uh, it was the, the Saturday before I came home. It was the day of the wedding. And this is such a hot time in Malawi. It's not like when we go in, in August where it's nice and cool, you know, max, uh, high temperature of like 80. Uh, it was like 110. And lots of lots of every creatures called mosquitoes from hell like it was just they were everywhere oh my gosh they were everywhere. but it was the day of the wedding we did the wedding and then we went to the reception the reception was outside and uh so i'm in a full suit sitting in the sunlight for like six hours and so i was sitting there and there wasn't lots of water because well there was water and things to drink but because there weren't many facilities available to use after you drink water um it was really hard and so i was sitting there that day i think up to that point it was, from the morning the reception started at 1 30 from about like morning to maybe three in the afternoon i hadn't had any water to drink and the sun was beating on me and i was i was feeling like i was just going to drop and so i was sitting there and i was just like oh god I was watching the bridal party, and they're all drinking water. I was like, oh, I'm going to mug one of them. And I, I didn't want to seem, you know, I didn't want to ask for anything. I didn't want to look around. I was the only white flake in a sea of, uh, of dark. And I said, I don't want to be the white guy to ask for a drink. Please, the white guy's going to pass out. Can you bring me something to drink? And so I sat there, and I said, Lord, I said, I don't know why it takes me so long so often I process things in my mind, I complain about things in my mind, I get frustrated in my mind before I will actually go to God and pray. <laughs> and so I sat there and I said, Lord, I said, I'm going to pass out. I said, I, I really could use a bottle of water. I said, I'm so thirsty. I said, Lord, I, I'm, I'm here because I'm doing what you want me to do. I need you to bring me a bottle of water. I sat down there. <clears throat> And I, after I prayed, I said, Lord, I'm going to sit and watch because I know you are good, especially if we do your will. Not even 10 minutes later, Pastor Adam leaned over to me and he said, oh, by the way, he said, there's a bottle of water coming for you. And he says, we have it in the car. And oh, a bottle of water that has been, I, I saw that bottle of water for days, yeah. for days. And I would not touch that bottle because I was like, that bottle has been in the African sun in that car for days. And I remember sitting in that car saying, God, I, I will not drink that bottle of water. And that was the very bottle of water that was brought to me. So when that bottle of water came, I was so thankful for that water. I was like, God, thank you. I was like, I don't care. If I you know, catch some kind of weird African disease, I, I'll do it. And I sat there, and I, it was tea. It was like drinking a glass. It was like going to India. India is so hot, and they give you hot water, which I love now. But it was like drinking a hot, it was just a hot, hot glass of water. So 
I drank that water, and I was so thankful. I said, Lord, thank you. You answered my prayer. I asked you for a bottle of water. And I started to smirk. I just felt like God was speaking to my heart. And I said, Lord, how often we're not even specific. I said, I should have asked you for a cold bottle of water. <laughs> Instead, I just asked you for a bottle of water. I drank that bottle of water. It didn't last long. And about an hour, two hours after that, I was still sitting there. The sun was setting, and its beam was Right where we were sitting, its beam was on our head the whole time till it just was about to set. It was about two hours before the sun set, and I finally said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I said, I can ask you for anything. I said, this time I'm asking you, can you bring me, I really could use, a bottle of soda and a cold bottle of water. And I kind of smirked. I laughed. I said, Lord, I'm going to trust you. If you brought me a hot bottle of water and I wasn't specific, now I'm specific, I'm trusting you to do it. Can I tell you that I said amen to the Lord? And I said, Lord, I'm going to sit and watch. No sooner did I sit and watch, a porter came by and he said, Pastor, he said, here's a bottle of soda. And he said, here is a cold bottle of water. And he set it before me. And I took that bottle of water. And it was just like this size, 500 mil. But the, it said 500 mil plus 50 additional mils. It, and I was like, 550 mils of water. And it was dripping. It, it was sweating that bottle because it was so cold. I sat there and I drank a bottle of soda and a cold bottle of water. Can I tell you, really, I sat back and I said, God, if you care so much about my thirst in something like this, how much do you care about every detail of my life? And how often we don't go to God because we just don't believe that God will actually do what he says he will do. I want to give you some research here because everyone says, oh, you're just talking about faith and faith and all that kind of good stuff. I want to give you some journals that have been written about prayer, which actually, these journals were written in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and early 2000s, and they stopped writing about this now because it's just not relevant. But I want to show you how relevant they are. Research, uh, this first article was written in the American Heart Association Journal. So th these are legitimate medical journals. These aren't like news articles. These are legitimate medical journals. Research at the San Francisco General Hospital has revealed that victims of heart attack, heart failure, and other cardiac problems who were remembered in prayers <coughs> fared better than those who were not. Cardiologist Randy Bird assigned 192 patients to the prayed-for group and 201 patients to the not-prayed-for group. All the patients were in the coronary intensive care unit. Patients, doctors, and nurses did not know which group patients were in. Prayer group members were scattered around the nation, and they were only given first names, diagnosis, and prognosis of patients. The researchers said that the results were dramatic. The prayed-for group had significantly fewer complications than the unremembered group, and fewer members of the former died. The latter group was five times more likely to develop infectious, requiring antibiotics, and three times more likely to develop lung condition leading to heart failure. But those that were prayed for, none of them had those complications. That's interesting, isn't that? That was in the American Heart Association Journal, an article published on if prayer has any effect in medicine. This next journal is from the Journal of Reproductive Medicine, also uh, um, a very recognized journal, and this doctor did a study. His uh, study was named Improved Outcomes Associated with Prayer. He writes, uh, this doctor studied 219 consecutive infertile women aged 26 to 46 years who were treated with in vitro infertilization embryo transfer in Seoul, South Korea. These women were randomized into distant prayer and control groups. Prayer was conducted by prayer groups in the USA, in Canada, and Australia. The patients and their providers were not informed about the intervention. The investigators and even the statisticians did not know the group allocations until all the data had been collected. Thus, the study was randomized, triple-blind, controlled, and perspective in design. So they set up this test. They didn't let anybody know who was being prayed for. No one knew anything so that they could really have an unbiased outcome, okay? This doctor found that the women who had been prayed for had more than twice as high a pregnancy rate as those who had not been prayed for. Furthermore, the women who had been prayed for showed a higher implantation rate than those who had not been prayed for. 
Finally, the benefits of prayer. This is what they write in this journal. The benefits of prayer were independent of clinical or laboratory providers and clinic variables. Thus, the study showed that distant prayer facilitates implantation in pregnancy. Prayer, for those that can't get pregnant, they found, actually, you pray for them, and they somehow get pregnant. This next article is in the Journal of Alternative Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine, a study, I believe, from Yale University. Dr. Lesniak described the study on the effects of intercessory prayer on specifically wound healing, okay, wound healing in non-human primate species. They, they found that prayer worked with people, so they said, hey, I wonder if it works with animals. If we pray for animals, can God actually uh, heal them if we ask God to do something so that they could find if praying to God really had an effect? So this is a very interesting study. The sample compromised of 22 bush babies, 22 monkeys, with, root, with wounds resulting from chronic self-injurious behavior. These animals were randomized into prayer and control groups that were similar at baseline. Prayer was conducted for four weeks. Okay, prayer was conducted for four weeks. Both groups of bush babies additionally re received a, a, an antibiotic treatment. Dr. Lesniak found that the prayer group animals had a greater reduction in wound size and a greater improvement in hematological parameters than the control animals. This study is important because it was conducted in a non-human species, therefore the likelihood of a placebo effect was removed. So they found that prayer caused significant healing. Let me give you this one last, uh, one last article here. Or maybe two articles, let's see. A 2005 study in the Journal of Behavioral Medicine comparing secular and spiritual forms of meditation. Secular and spiritual forms of meditation. Before I explain the rest of the article, let me explain this. Secular meditation, meaning you're just sitting trying to empty your head and meditating on, I am, I can do it, I can do it. That's secular meditation. Spiritual meditation, they use this control. Uh, I'll explain it here as I read it. Uh, medicine comparing secular and spiritual forms of meditation found spiritual meditation to be more calming than secular meditation. In secular meditation, you focus on something such as your breath or a non-spiritual word. In spiritual meditation, you focus on a spiritual word or a text. Participants were divided into two groups, some being taught how to meditate using self-affirmation, I am love, that's secular meditation, Others were taught to meditate with word that described a higher power. They were taught to meditate only God is love. Then they meditated for 20 minutes a day for four weeks. Researchers found that the group that practiced spiritual meditation showed greater decreases in anxiety and stress and a more positive mood. They also tolerated pain almost twice as long when they were asked to put their hands in an ice water bath. Some scientists who study prayer believe that people who pray are benefiting from a feeling of emotional support. Imagine carrying, this is, this is in the article, imagine carrying a backpack hour after hour, it will start to feel uh, impossibly heavy. But if you can hand it off to someone else to hold for, for a while, it will feel lighter when you pick it up again. The doctor says, we found that this is what prayer does. How, how ridiculous is that? Jesus says, come unto me all who are weak and heavy burdened and I will give you rest. And these medical journals are, are writing, it's unbelievable when you pray. It feels like you're carrying a backpack and that backpack is taken from you. This is what prayer can do, said Amy uh, Washaltz, Associate Professor of Clinical Health Psychology and Director at the University of Colorado, Denver. And it led researchers on the meditation study. It lets you put down your burden mentally and rest. That's power in prayer. These are medical journals. Now I want to give you the opposite. The, the only publications that write negatively against prayer, which is kind of funny, the only publications that deny the results of prayer are no surprise. It's the New York Times and the LA Times, which everyone loves to quote, which is not even a publication, but a media outlet. The New York Times claims that there is no research concluding that prayer helps. And the Los Angeles Times says that prayer is a fraud when it comes to medical research, which I don't know how they can 
uh, contradict what's uh, written in medical journals. These publications are not research but agenda vomiters, one writer writes. So it's really interesting to see that. The reason I wanted to, to read these uh, journals is obviously we as believers, as Christians, we know the power in prayer. We know the power that we have when we come to God. But I, I want you to be able to see it not just from a faith initiative or from a faith point of view, but to realize that even secular studies, medical journals, have written that for some reason prayer changes things. Now, the reason uh, it was uh, amazing reading uh, why medical journals are no longer talking about prayer, medical journals have stopped writing about the power of prayer in medical research is because they've come up to a dilemma. They said that if we show that prayer helps, then the question comes, who are we praying to and does God really exist? And it's something that medical research doesn't want to touch. They don't want to get dirty with that kind of a, uh, a topic. So they've stopped producing these medical journals. That's why the last one was written in 2001. No, no surprise in considering the direction of our nation. Prayer changes your life. Prayer changes your life. Knowing God, praying, changes your life. And that's what Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping with it an attitude of thanksgiving. If you go to your page there, uh, that's in your bulletin, uh, we'll fill in some blanks and go through. Uh, I've written two quotes. I know there's a lot of quotes I've written, but the first quote says from A.C. Dixon, when we rely upon organization, we get what organization can do. When we rely upon education, we get what education can do. When we rely upon eloquence, we get what eloquence can do. And so on. Nor am I disposed to undervalue any of these things in their proper place. But when we rely upon prayer, we get what God can do. That's such a good Good premise. If we rely on everything else in our life, we always receive from that. We receive from that, and it's never enough. Because we don't fill the void that we have. We don't fill the cavity that God can change us, equip us, that God can go deep into our life and cause there to be transformation. But when we rely on prayer, we get what God can do. That second one from E.M. Bounds, he writes, The central significance of prayer is not in the things that happen as a result, but in the deepening intimacy and unhurried communion with God at His central throne of control in order to discover a sense of God's need, in order to call on God's help to meet that need. You, in prayer, you realize that you cannot make it anymore. That everything that you tried only goes so far and it can no longer uh, uh, meet that need in your life. But when you go to God, you realize that you go to a limitless being. A being who has all power, all supremacy in our life. And when we ask God to do something that is impossible, the Bible says with man many things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's the premise of prayer. We go to God because we know that God can equip and change us and that God could answer us in ways that, there are, that we find no answer to. That God can equip us in no answer. I, I'm gonna, I want to say this as a, as a bit of a testimony and also as a, I want to continue to show you the power of prayer. Okay, uh, My cousins came from, uh, from Canada here and uh, this is the first time I met um, Dane. I'm so thankful uh, to meet him. Uh, What's your technical title in the work that you do? How do you say it? Personal trainer. Personal trainer. Well, he, he, you do... Muscle activation. Mu okay, that's it. Muscle activation therapy. Okay. I like the bigger name better. It's, a, it's different than... Uh, people are still trying to figure yeah. out. Yeah, I know people are trying to figure out. Listen, many of you know I had like a crazy um, hip injury in July. And I have been struggling with my hip for a long time. Since July. And I was... Asking God, praying, asking God, God, I, I just want to be able to walk from Malawi. So when I get to Malawi, I can walk. I can, I can do something like that. The reason I'm saying this is because I want to acknowledge what God has done. God did something so unique in my life. I made it to Malawi, and I, I walked around, and I did everything I needed to, but even walking in some of their roads, every time they would walk, I'd have to catch myself. It felt like my hip was going to just just go and i worked through that process worked through that process i said i don't want to burden 
um, my, my friends there, the pastors there, which pray for me all the time. And I said, I'm not going to say anything. But when it got to the last day that I was there, I finally said to Pastor Adam, I said, Pastor, you're, you're like my best friend. And uh, we pray for each other. So I told him my whole situation, my whole issue with, with my hip. He said, no problem. He said, we're going to pray. He said, God's going to send you the answer. We're going to pray. Before I left, my flight uh, out of uh, Lelongwe, Malawi was at 2 a.m. in the morning. We got to the airport. I needed to be there at midnight. We got there at 11, and we were going to go in. Pastor Adam said, no, 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 we we have an hour before you need to be at the airport. He said, we're staying in the car, and he said, we're going to pray for this hour. I said, okay. He sat there, and he laid hands on me, and he prayed and prayed and prayed. He prayed at least 40 minutes over my hip that God would not only let everything return, but that God would bring the right situation, that God would bring the situation where something will happen, that hip will be aligned again, the muscles will all come together, all that that kind of stuff, right? So I thank God, and I said, all right, God. I said, you know, I went back to the whole water bottle and soda thing at the wedding. I said, all right, God, I, I trusted you for water bottle. I trusted you for soda, and you did it. Now I'm trusting you for my hip. I said, Pastor Adam said to me, why do you want your hip to be well? I said, there's a lot I want to do. I said, I want to be able to serve God. I want to be able to travel and preach. And I said, I don't want this to, in- to harm me, to stop me from doing that. I came home. I got on my flight. And I said, all right, God, I'm going to learn patience. I'm going to trust you. And my flight, I was on a 24-hour flight from Malawi with all the stops when I finally reached New York. And the whole time... I'm trusting God, saying, all right, God, I, I'm, I'm waiting for you to do it. I'm waiting for you to do it, for you to bring a change in my hip. I'm waiting for you to do it. Got back uh, late Tuesday night. I uh, got back uh, late Monday night. Tuesday, I was here. Uh, I had the day off to recuperate a little bit. Wednesday, I went to work with Jose. And Wednesday was fine. Thursday was a little, eh. We had the rehearsal dinner for Marissa's wedding. Friday, uh, I went to work again. Friday was so rough. Friday, I, I struggled that day of work. I would pick up something, and my hip would just go. And I'm like, God, I can't even straighten my hip. I, I can't do this. I'm, I'm trusting you to do something. I'm trusting you to bring all things together because I prayed, and I know you are God who answers my prayer. You guys came Friday night? Friday night. Friday night, uh, my cousin arrives. Uh, they came from Canada. I spent the whole time driving, and Dane is this, you know, mu- muscle abuser. And so so he comes, and because my, my mom struggles with her back, my cousin said, oh, don't worry about it. Dane's going to, he'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. So they sent me. We had dinner at my mother's house, and they said Dane left his, his table, his massage table. It's not a little massage table. They left him in his car at my aunt's house. So I drove him to the house. He opens the trunk, and he pulls out, like, this massive Massive table, it, bigger than the ones you see in the Chinatown. <laughs> and so we bring that table, we move all the furniture out of our living room, they set up the table, and he works on my mom, works on my mom, works on my mom, working her muscles. And, and at dinner, my mother and my sister are like, oh, Dane, you should fix Ray's hip. And I'm like, leave the guy alone. You know, I just met the guy, leave the guy alone. And I was sitting there, and I'm like, God, I'm praying for you to send me the answer. Praying for you to send me the answer. What does God do? He sends my cousin. He sends this guy here. And Dane says, get up on the table. I said, all right. Changed into shorts. And how's this for the first time you meet somebody? (laughs) He's stripped down. He's like rubbing deep muscles in areas. I'm like, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. But Dane starts working on my, my hip. And he, he does something. He's like, ah, this is nothing. He's like, this is muscle. I'm like, yeah. He said that this is just muscular. You know, I, I've been going to a chiropractor now for months and trying to adjust me, all this kind of stuff, and nothing has been working. So when he said, ah, this is muscle, I'm like, all right, God. I've heard this a thousand times. He worked deep in my muscle. He pulled my leg, and I'm like, God, could this be it? At that moment, I felt a muscle in my leg tremor really hard like tremor and i don't know how to describe it dane, dane said it the best when i said it but it almost felt like the muscle reset itself 
it like dropped into place. And he was moving my leg. And that whole day, I was struggling to walk. I was struggling to move my leg. At that moment on the table, my muscle reset. And the pain was completely gone. Completely gone. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. There's no way. There's no way. So I was walking around. He's walking around, going up and down stairs. And I didn't say this to him, but the only thing I, I was thinking was, oh God, I was in an hour of prayer in Malawi, saying, God, I trust you that you'll send the right person, that you'll do the right thing, so that you can heal my body, so that I can do what you want me to do. And Four days later, God did something in my hip from my cousins coming down, visiting. Tell me that God doesn't answer prayer. That God doesn't care about the things in my life. So I, I say that to say, Dane, you don't know the backstory, but you are actually an answer to prayer coming to this point. That God used you in really an amazing way. So in, in that regard, I say, you know, your business... Uh, I have to say this, I'll say this publicly here, but your, your business is not just your business. It, God really has more for your life and has something so specific for your business that is that is more unique than you understand because God sent you as an answer to, to something I've been praying for for a long time. And so that is something so phenomenal there. So I, I, I thank God for that, that point. Yeah, for sure. And Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is I'm telling you, this is one of those things where I, I I start to see all these little pieces and realize. Paul says, "Devote yourselves to prayer." For what reason? So that we can waste time, so that we can just say, "Oh, I'm going through a spiritual discipline," or so that God can say, "I will meet the needs that are in your life, if you really trust me to do so." So here I am, my leg. I, I, I have to say, it is. What percentage is it better? I think I'm at like at least 95% mobility. The only thing that's left is that my muscles feel like I got beat up, and that's just my muscles stretching. And, and all the torturous yeah, exercises. Yeah, all the, yeah he, he, put, he made me do some exercise, and I was like, I never used those muscles in my life. I don't, I don't know why. Yeah, I, I don't know if he, was, if he was really being legitimate. And some of the pressure points he was saying, I'm like, I don't even think there's a muscle there. Why are you? Like, you stay down, <laughs> but yeah, there were, uh, so I, I'm feeling I'm feeling that. But the reason I know that God did a, a work in me is because uh, even though even the days that I had relief when I would lay down in bed, if I laid on that side of my hip, it would ache, and I kept waking up hour after hour with the ache in my hip. And now it's been since Friday I've slept, and I haven't had anything in my hip. And so God has really done an amazing work. But that came through sitting an hour in prayer. And I remember thinking when, uh, when Pastor Adam said to me, we're going to spend this hour in prayer, I was thinking, a whole hour? Like, you know, I was ready to get on the plane. You know, it was such a good thing. My trip was phenomenal. God did amazing things. But there gets a point where I'm just like, I, I want to see my wife. I want to see my kids. I just, I want to eat like a slice of pizza, which Jen brought to the airport. Like all these things, you know, I, I can't wait. I, I think of all these cultures. I, I, I was craving things. That I, was, I was craving balut at one point. I'm like, just give me something. Give me something other than mystery meat. And so all these, I couldn't wait to get home. And Pastor Adam's like, we're going to spend an hour in prayer. I'm like, an hour in prayer. I said, yeah, my suitcase is here. I'll just go inside and sit. But I'm telling you, when I, I struggle with that, we're going to spend an hour in prayer. I'm like, what am I, Ridiculous. I'm being so stupid to think that hour in prayer will change my life. And we sat that hour and he prayed 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 that God would do something. And I came home anticipating it and God did it. Tell me we ought not to pray. We ought to spend time in prayer. We ought to spend time in prayer. Let's start on the points. I know I, I did a big roundabout here. We're going to spend time. Let's hit these points. Number one on your page. If you have a pen, you can fill in the blanks. If not, you know, pretend you're doing it. Number one, prayer must develop from a set time. Prayer must develop from a set time through to every situation. Prayer must develop from a set time through to every situation. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. Devotion does not denote one moment in time. If you're devoted to something, it doesn't mean you just pick up something and you do it. You do it all the time. That's devoting yourself, you know. When I, when I, uh, after uh, 
Dane manipulated my body, I said to him, how, uh, how, 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 much, how often do I have to do these, these exercises? He's like, every day. Why is that? Why is that? Is there a benefit if I just do it once a week? There's no benefit. The devotion is that you do it every day. Prayer ought to be a set time. We ought to have a moment where we say, God, I'm stopping my day and I'm committing to spend time with you. I'm committing it to bring you all my frustration, all of my hurt, all of my issues, to bring you all of my aspirations, and to just say, God, this moment I stop my day. There is something that happens when you stop your day. If you don't stop your day, it's just a fleeting moment, a passing a passing. Uh, um, let me say, a passing frustration with God. When we're running in passive, oh God, help touch my life. And then we run, run, run and realize, ah, God didn't do anything. We're so frustrated with Him because we don't have set devotion with Him. To say, God, at this moment, at this time, I'm going to spend it with you. At this moment in time, I'm going to stop what I'm doing to seek you, to know you. Devotion must develop. Prayer must develop from a set time, and then you realize when you have that discipline of a set time with God, then when you finally start praying on the fly, you see that God answers your prayer and that you have that relationship with God. Listen, I, I have my set moment with God every morning. The first thing I do, I wake up, I crack my Bible, my journal, I spend time with God in prayer. That spending time with prayer allows me to get to a point where I'm going to pass out from exha exhaustion, from, uh, uh, from dehydration, and be able to say, God, I'm coming to you now in a fleeting moment. I need you right now, and God supplies your need. The supply that we're looking for in the fleeting moments stem from time that we spend with God. Time that we spend with God, knowing God. Devotion does not denote one moment in time. It denotes incorporation into every facet of life. <clears throat> That's why we read verse 1. I said, in context, Paul is talking to masters and slaves in their daily responsibilities. <clears throat> masters grant your slaves justice, uh, fairness, knowing that you too have a master. In the previous chapter, he talks to slaves and how they ought to respond to their masters. But here... We must bring prayer into our work, into our school, into our conversation, into all the details of your life, because you realize that God is not just a passing moment in our life. He is to envelop everything that we do, every moment of our life, like Nikki brought last week in bringing God through our work. <clears throat> that co that uh, quote by John Piper says, Praying only as crises enter your life would not be a pattern of devotion to prayer. How many people often only pray in that regard. When there's a crisis in your life, oh God, why couldn't you do something? God, why won't you answer me? God, why you... Come on. Imagine. My son can come up to me anytime he wants. He, they, they, he doesn't, they, don't, they never do this. I don't know why. I, I, I was different. I remember when my father, would, when I was little, my father would come home from work, especially on the days that he got paid. Oh, we just would go stand by my father. Hi, hi, Pa. <laughs> <laughs> just stand there, give him a hug and a kiss, and my father would, I remember that, those were days of allowance, my father would divvy up and boop, 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 and we'd all go back to our room, and we'd have our, our bu <clears throat> these kids don't do that at all, I have great kids, but Mark would never, would ask me for like 20 bucks, or anything like that, <clears throat> maybe you should, but, it's incredible, I always, I'll give to him anything, give to them almost anything, but imagine if he just went to like, random, Anybody, I know you guys know, know him, probably everybody would, would, would help my son in a way, but imagine you just went to a random person, hey, can I have $20? <laughs> Get out of here. I don't know you. It's like the people in, the, in Manhattan on the street. Half of them are fakes. Can I have money? No. No, you can't have money. I'm going to starve. No. There's a soup kitchen right there. <laughs> you can go eat over there. You receive based on your relationship. If a child has a relationship, you receive. That child receives. It's the same thing with God. God gives everybody the free gift of eternal life, for sure. Everybody can go to God and receive eternal life. But you want God to change the disciplines, the details of your life? You've got to spend time with Him. You've got to develop that relationship with God. Work that relationship and realize He is my Father. He cares for me for all the details that I go through. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Alright, number two. Number two. Devoted prayer manifests through situational alertness. Devoted prayer manifests through situational 
Alertness. And what do I mean by that? Verse 2 says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert. Keeping alert. <laughs> A better, a better word, I guess, would be keeping awake, maybe. God is not only a big picture God, but He is active in every situation and event. We must develop alertness. We must develop alertness. And what do we mean by that? The more alert we become in prayer, the more we see the hand of God moving. Alertness carries the idea of a reflexive motion, a reflexive motion in keeping prayer at the center of what we do. I love that. I don't see doctors do that much anymore. You remember when you were younger and you go to the doctor? At least that's what they would do here. I don't know. Maybe they, they would do here and that doctor would pull out that rubber hammer. Do you remember? I don't know. Do my legs work anymore? Maybe. Yeah, they're. And they hit your knee. And it was like, wow, look at that. And then we go to school and we do this everybody. <laughs> so I'm like, ah. But we, we did it just to see that reflex. And that reflex moving. I love that. That's, that's to see if, you're, uh, if your body is responding the way it's supposed to be responding. Your body is to, to be reflexive uh, automatically. That is what we ought to be in prayer. Prayer ought to develop into a reflex. Not a, a retreat or not a just when I'm struggling. It ought to be the reflex of everything that we do. That's why I love uh, being in Malawi. Uh, this, this season, I really enjoyed it. Pastor Adams is brilliant when he does this. No, we can go out ten times a day, ten times a day, as soon as we sit in the car. He'll sit in the car with the windows down, with all the flies coming in, and he'll turn the car off, and he'll say, Lord, we ask you to protect us on our trip into the center of town. God, that you would help us do everything that we need to accomplish everything we need to do. All right, boom. We go out, come back, pull into the driveway, into the, the house. He said, God, thank you so much that you surrounded us, you protected us from everything, and you helped us accomplish what we need to do. Two minutes later, oh, we forgot something. We need to go back out. Okay, sit in the car. God, and I'm like, oh, didn't we pray? <laughs> Let me tell you, the reflexive nature of going after God accomplishes much. And I saw this happen. We went out to to buy some last minute things for his daughter's wedding. And we were praying in the car, like he always does, reflexive nature. God, we're thanking you, direct our every step. We got to certain places, they didn't have what we needed. We finally got to this one one outlet uh, store area. He got, we found what he needed at like the most discounted price. It was ridiculous. He's like, this is the one, this is the one. We bought that item and immediately sat in the car and he said, God, Thank you that you led all of our steps, that you always care. Wait, where does that come from? How does God meet your need in the middle of nowhere? How does God bless you and God causes you to find the right place, even the right product that you need to buy? Because it's reflexive from coming after God at every moment. God, I'm again turning my life to you. I'm trusting you that you'll be in the details of my life and you'll find that God will be in the details of your life. That God will move in the details is a reflexive motion. It's not only about looking around and seeing where there is attack. You can feel that word attack. So many times we think alertness is like, oh, where's the bad going to happen? Where's the bad going to happen? It's not about where, the, where there's the attack. It's more about bringing prayer into every situation reflexively. It's, it's being able to say, God, I am, ta- I am bringing you in, inviting you. See, God is everywhere, right? The Bible says He is omnipresent. He's all over the place. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. So it's not like we're saying, Oh God, I'm going to invite you into my car because He's already there. God is everywhere at every moment. But it's inviting Him into your personal locked situation that we so often block God from joining. God, I'm allowing you. I'm letting you. I want you to come into my space. I want you to come into my attitude. Those are better words than space. I want you to come into my attitude. I want you to come into my frustration. I want you to come into my my uh, hard head and holding on to the situations that I want to be done the way I want them. And I ask you to come in and change those. Wow. That's taking God into the into our life reflexively. Let's look at this last one here. Number three, we must develop, this is the hard one, we must develop thankfulness to God for the opportunity that we are in. Oh, that's a, that's a sucky one. 
See the song that we sang this morning, that first one? I, I, I didn't even realize it. I just took the song from last week that uh, they sang while I was gone. I'm like, ah, that's a good one. Let's do that one. And we didn't sing the bridge part. Also, verse 1 says, For your beauty, for your goodness, for your wisdom, awesome God, we praise you. How, that's cool. We, we thank God for his beauty and his goodness, right? We thank God for wisdom. That next one, for your power, for your honor, for your splendor, mighty God. Yes, we praise God for that. That's wonderful. We worship God. We bless Him forever. For your kindness, for your favor. Yes, we worship God. Uh, for your fire, for your testing. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe we won't thank God for that one. <laughs> for your fire, for your testing. Wait a minute. Actually, that's, that's biblical. That's James chapter 1, verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2. Anybody know that one? James 1, verse 2? Come on. Consider it all joy when you face trials of every kind because you realize that trials produce perseverance. Perseverance, endurance, they'll run a race in your life. And it gets worse. It gets worse in there. Okay. So we thank God for, your, for His fire and His testing. Oh, wait. We thank God for fire and testing. We must develop thankfulness to God. That's why Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being alert with an attitude of thanksgiving. God, I'm thanking you that even though my life is... See, (laughs) praying for my hip was praying that God would do something and then thanking God that God's going to do something no matter how I feel. And you know what? This whole week in different things, different steps, different pains... I'm going through, I I had those moments hitting my hips saying, God, come on, man, come on. But then those moments of saying, all right, God, thank you. (laughs) Thank you that I'm still walking. Thank you that you're still over my life. Whether you heal me or don't heal me, I'm thanking you for it. And Paul says that's what we ought to have is thankfulness. So we must always look and thank God for the opportunity we are in. Let me just say that again. I want you to think of that one phrase. We must always look and thank God for the opportunity that we are in. The opportunity. Not just a situation. Because so many of our situations are terrible. So many of our situations are broken and hurtful. So many of our situations are strained. We're not thanking God that, hey, I'm thanking you, God, that it feels like my life sucks. No. God, I'm thanking you because this is the opportunity to see you in my life. This is the opportunity for you to do a miracle. This is the opportunity for you to answer. This is the opportunity. Listen, when Elijah took, went up on the mountain in front of all the false prophets of Baal, Elijah wasn't thanking God. God, I thank you that I'm in, I'm in the middle of all my enemies. God, I'm thanking you that I am in a really terrible situation here and that at any moment people can take my life. Elijah prayed, he was thanking God that God is still a God who answers. And at that moment, God answered. The thankfulness in our prayer is not thankful just for where we are. We're thankful that where we are, no matter how difficult, is always the opportunity for God to move in our life. There's always the opportunity to say, God, I may have pain, but you are still, this is the opportunity for you to do something, and I trust you through it. It's for the opportunity we are in. And this is where we develop, you can fill these last two words in, this is where we develop grateful language. How many of you are terrible at grateful language? I am terrible at grateful language. I, 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 I love my family. I love my family so much. I love my family so much. But let me tell you, I, I, my family, I think by personality trait, is not the, life is so good kind of family, you know? It's not, I think a lot of families are like, very few people are like that. I think if they're listening, I'll just say a nice thing about my in-laws. My in-laws are, are like that. They're, they're the type of people, wasn't that wonderful? I'm like, not really. <laughs> didn't that person have a good voice? Uh, I didn't know if we heard the same person. You know, isn't that a cute baby? Not really. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, it's a struggle through there. But we ought to develop grateful language. That ought to be the words that come out of our mouth. The words that, that determine what God is doing. God, my situation may be hard, but instead of confessing the hardness of my situation, our words turn around, thank you, God, that this is the opportunity for you to do something in my life. God, this is the opportunity for me to praise you no matter what I'm walking through, no matter what I'm feeling. Now, this last thing says, we must become opportunity seekers. 
opportunity seekers. Your situation, the hardness of your situation is God's opportunity for your life. We must become opportunity seekers and not emotionally defeated situationists. Emotionally defeated situationist. A situationist is somebody that takes that moment right as it is and they'll take everything they can out of it and they'll be frustrated in that very one moment. We are not limited to a moment. We have an eternal God who takes us out of moment and He brings us, the Bible says, from glory to glory to glory. God takes you from one situation to another situation to another situation and we know that we have the movement of God in our life not to be stuck where the world says, as you're stuck in that place, you'll never get out of that place. We're not of that kind of people. The Bible says we're different. We're different from that. We are opportunity seekers because we have an opportunistic God that we serve. God will always make a way. Is that true? There's a sea that blocks, God makes a way. There's a dead road, God makes a way. God says, you may look at a desert, Isaiah says, Isaiah uh, chapter 44, there's a desert before you, God says, I see streams flowing in the desert. God is an opportunistic God. We ought to be opportunity seekers, not emotionally defeated situationists. We must be thankful no matter the situation, because God is in control of our lives. I love that. God is in control of our lives. Devote yourselves to prayer. Oh, shoot, maybe we should pray. Devote yourselves to prayer. Maybe we ought to actually pause and and take our day or or make that effort and say, you know what, tomorrow morning, in the rush of my life, I'm actually going to stop. I'm going to read a verse from the Scripture, but I'm going to spend a moment and say, God, I'm inviting you into my life so that you can control every detail that I face. And watch and see that God will change the hardness of your life into the most incredible opportunity. Those are the best things. When things seem at their dead end, God makes a way. That's the beauty of Him. That's the beauty of Him. The moving forward portion I wrote just says, Purposefully invite an attitude of prayer into every part of your day. Then look. (laughs) See God moving in the situation And begin thanking Him for it. Begin thanking Him for it. God has something for your life. You know that. You're not stuck where you are. You're not at a dead end. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for your family. He has a, a plan for your kids. He has a plan for your work. All of that to influence and change your world for His purpose. So that God will be glorified in your life. God would be glorified in your life. That people watching you would see the impossibility and then see God who changes impossible into possible. What what an awesome awesome attribute here. Well, let's do it. Let's go to God in prayer today and thank Him for what He's doing. Let's pray. God, I thank You for Your Word and what we can find from it. God, I don't know why... You did things the way you did even this morning with all of these stories and illustrations. But God, you're doing something so unique. God, I pray for each person this morning here, especially those that you have brought in here, friends, family, Lord, um, relationships, all the struggles of our life. There is a reason for this word. God, we pray. Maybe we've never done that before. But we pray that you would enter and fill every situation of our life. God, would you come into our work? Would you come into our relationships? God, would you come into the impossibility of our life? The hardness of our life? The frustration of our life? We invite you to come in. Jesus, we invite you to come in, first of all, Because we need a Savior. We need a Savior. But God, we can't manage our life on our own. Every time we try to do it, we just hit a wall and we mess it up. And we become frustrated. But God, I ask you, even what you've done in my life thus far, I speak over this congregation, 
that they would see your hand moving over their lives. Lord, I speak that word, that the impossibilities of their current situation would break. And God, you would move in power, showing them your love and direction. Lord, I speak this over this congregation, that the direction you have for them is bigger than what they think. God, you have something so much greater for their relationships. You have something so much greater for their work in business. You have something so much deeper and greater for their marriage. You have something so much greater and deeper for their children. Lord, we come to you in prayer, waiting on you, because you are a God who answers your children. Your your word says, Lord, that you incline your ear towards your children. Your eyes are always watching those who belong to you. Lord, we put ourselves under your care, submitting ourselves to you because you love us and care for us. God, I pray that you would bless us this morning and the time we have with each other. We turn our focus on you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God has something for your life. Don't forget it. God has something for your life. He really does. Your situation is not impossible. Amen. You ought to do that. Hug somebody this morning. Eat a biscuit, a cup of coffee. Hug somebody and let them know God has something for your life. Would you do that? God bless you guys. We'll see you this coming.